Okay, yeah, okay. So we can start. So first of all, thanks for coming to this session in which we will discuss uh, the Java virtual machine running in containers. Uh, my name is David Delabasse. Uh, despite my French accent, I'm not from France, but I'm from Belgium, from the French-speaking side of Belgium, where I, wear, wh where I work for Oracle in the GPG group, so the Java platform group. So basically, I report to the, uh, uh, GPG uh, in the US. Uh, this, is the s this is an important slide. This is a Steph Arbor statement slide from Oracle, so please read it with great attention. Thank you. Uh, then, I'm using a MacBook Pro. If, like me, you are using one of those uh, MacBook Pro, you might know that there are a lot of issues with the uh, design keyboard. It has been fixed many times, but it still doesn't work. And in fact, it has been fixed for the fourth time uh, last May, and it's still broken. So it's basically the first keyboard in history to launch with a replacement program on day one. The thing is that today I'm gonna do a few demos, so if any of my demo fail, it's not my fault, it's just because of the bro broken keyboard. I'm serious about that. Okay. Java and containers. So uh, I guess that I don't have to spend too much time on containers, but just to set the stage. So container ad adoption. So this is a Stack, flow, stack Overflow uh, survey that was done, I think, last May. And basically, you see uh, that 46% of the users on Stack Overflow don't use containers. So that basically means that more uh, of 50% of Stack Overflow users are using containers. Containers. So clearly, I think that we can all agree that today containers are, are widely widely used. What is a container? So basically, it's a it's a way to package software in a standardized unit. That's very convenient for development, but also uh, for shipment of the, of that unit. So basically, everything is included. You can easily uh, ship it to somewhere else, and you can also deploy it very easily in different environment. In terms of runtimes, there are quite a lot of runtimes. Um, the most widely used those days is Docker, but there's also Cryo, which is used, being used more and more by Kubernetes, Elixir, Rocket, and so on and so on. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, because what I, what, what I would go discuss today applied to any type of container technologies. Now, we shouldn't... Uh, well, there is a big difference between containers and virtual machines. So, uh, containers tend to taste like virtual machines, but they are clearly not virtual machines. Uh, Virtual machines rely on an hypervisor to provide a strong uh, isolation, something that we don't have with containers, because containers basically relies on namespace and C groups uh, to, to provide some kind of isolation, but at the, other, at the end of the day, containers still rely on the host operating system. So basically, you are using the same operating system within uh, containers. With, hyper, hyper, with an hypervisor, you can have different operating system than the host operating system. Now you can run container within VM. It makes perfectly sense, but you can't do the other way around. And then in between, we have what we call kata containers, which are basically, which provide strong isolation, but with basically the speed of containers. Because clearly, uh, VM are, are startup, you know, well, are, are, are sorry, are, um, takes a lot of time to, to boot up. A container will start up in a matter of seconds, while a VM might take minutes. So that's one of the drawbacks of VM versus containers. Catan containers are trying to resolve that. All the benefit of containers with the benefit and isolation of VMs. So, so today I'm gonna to discuss basically uh, Java running within uh, containers. And at the, end of the, at the end of the day, it's just boiled down to Java virtual machine running within containers. So what I'm gonna to discuss today, I'm gonna to use the Java language, but it also applied to Kotlin. It basically applied to any uh, language that runs on top of the, of the virtual machines. So today, uh, we have just released two weeks ago Java 13. You know, well, you know the story that Sharat explained uh, this morning. So uh, Java 14 is coming uh, in March, and the current long-term release of Java is Java 11. It doesn't really matter as long as you are using one of those releases, you are on, on the safe path. Now, there is a strong adoption uh, for containers, but if we look at the Java, the GVM landscape, uh, we have a lot of, lot of tools that also help us to use containers. So, you, for example, we have the ability to create containers directly from Maven. There are different plugins that helps us to do that. Uh, there's test containers that allows you to test your code within uh, containers from uh, Java, those kind of things. Then we have a bunch of microservices frameworks, Java-based, that are, uh, make it very easy to use containers. If you look at Elidon, Quarkus, Micronaut, and others, basically, 
to turn your microservices application into a container is just a matter of one command line. You don't have to deal with the Docker file and so on. Everything is handled directly for you by the framework itself. And next to that, we have the, the fast world. So the function as a services world where we have a lot of platforms that are providing Java support using containers. And if you, in, in fact, if you look at all the fast, so all the serverless uh, platform out there, they are all based on containers, either explicitly like FN Project, OpenFast, or OpenWhisk, or implicitly like uh, Amazon Lambdas, for example. So what I'm going to discuss today apply uh, to uh, using Java within microservices frameworks and containers, but also using Java within the serverless space, because at the end of the day, it's just a GVM running within a container. If it's exposed or not, that container doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So running Java in containers basically boils down to two uh, things. Um, first, the Java virtual machine should behave as a good container citizens. So basically, the Java virtual machine needs to understand that it runs within a container, and it, it needs to behave accordingly. And then, uh, everything which is linked to the latencies uh, is key. Um, when I say latency, it's basically the time it takes to start the container and the application that runs within the containers. Uh, one of the things that we tend to observe with containers is that basically they are disposal. So you start a container with an application, it will run for some time for weeks, but sometimes your container and your application will run for one minute, two minutes, it really depends. And it can be worse than that. If we are talking about serverless function, your containers and the, the Java virtual machine will only run for one second, five seconds at most. So latency uh, is key when we are uh, talking about uh, those kind of deployments with containers. So I'm going to start with a very short uh, demo. Nothing uh, really fancy. So I have Docker running here. It's empty. Um, I have a very basic Docker file. So basically what it does, it takes Java latest, create a directory. We have a hello world locally that it's being copied within the container. We are using Java C to compile that into a class and then we run that Java code. So it's a, it's a very simple hello world. So if we look at the hello world in itself, it's pretty basic. Basically, it looks at some of the environments, uh, some, 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 some environment. So it looks basically at how many CPUs we have and so on, and it just displays that. So it's, it's a very uh, simple uh, application. So let's build that. So Docker build minus T, uh, let's call it TPE, and that's the context. It's very fast because it has already been uh, cached. And let, let's run that, that container. So docker run uh, tpe. So this is our application, uh, our hello world application running within, within the containers. So it's, it's pretty basic, but if we look at the size of that application, sorry, the size of that docker image that contain our application, takes a bit of time. That means that it's a quite huge uh, container. So our container for that very basic application weight than more than six, 600 megabytes, which is an issue. I mean, we saw that in terms of startup time, it's not highly efficient. So that's something that we need to look at. So that's what we will do next, latency. Um, so we basically want our Java code to run as quickly as possible. Uh, there are two layers, two levels on which we can work on. The first one is at the container level. So we basically want to try to start the container as quickly as possible. And the next level is basically once the container is started, the GVM will have to start with the code running inside. And uh, that's something that we will look at. So if we, if we look at the container levels, uh, we have to keep in mind that the container is basically just a bunch of layers uh, stacked together. So we have a bunch of uh, layers that compose our uh, final image. When it comes to Java containers, there are basically three types of layers. So we have the operating system layers. Obviously, it can be composed of different layers, but let's say that let's just pretend that there is one operating system layers. Then there's the Java runtime layers, and on top of that, we have the Java application layers, which include the Java uh, classes and uh, all the dependencies required to run our Java code. What we want to achieve is basically to reduce those layers size uh, as much as we can. Why? Because each time we need to start the container, uh, our container runtime will have to fetch from a registry that container image. 
the larger, the larger is it, the, the image is, the more time it will take. So we need to make sure that basically our container is as small as we can. So if we look at the first layer, the Java layer, so that's really the top layers, um, well, we can only give you uh, advice, best practices. For example, watch out, uh, watch out when it comes to dependencies. Uh, make sure that you are not bringing uh, uh, dependencies that are not used, typically transitive dependencies, those, ki those kind of things. So you want to basically have within your containers only bits that will be used. So watch out for that. And also, you can also um, do some improvements. Like, for example, if you have very static things, like you have dependency that doesn't change. What you can do, well, you can put that in a different layer. It will just save uh, startup time, and it also helps the, doc the, sorry, the container uh, runtime to basically um, use its cache, because that layer will not change. So there is no, no mean to reload that layer uh, from a remote registry, for example. So um, now let's look at uh, the same example that I've just, well, no, let, let's first discuss that one. Um, so, the next layer that we can work on, so basically, bottom, then I'm going, uh, sorry, I was talking about the top layer, now we are going to the bottom layer, which is the operating system layer. Uh, the idea is that we basically want to have an operating system that is relatively lightweight. Um, so, what we can do when it comes to Java, we can rely on a lightweight Linux distribution such as Alpine. So, Alpine is a, Alpine is a Linux distro that weighs between four and five megabytes. So it's super lightweight. But there is an issue with Alpine. Alpine is, is using Muscles. So Muscle is basically an alternative to LibC, LibC being the C library that the Java virtual machine used to talk to the underlying Linux operating system. And Muscle is a different uh, library, it's an alternative. So what we're doing through Project Portola, which uh, fall under the OpenGDK umbrella, is basically making sure that OpenGDK can be compiled uh, on top of Muscles. So that means that we can use OpenGDK with uh, Muscle, and hence we can use OpenGDK on top of Halpine, for example. So that's one way of basically shrinking the operating system a layer. Something else that we can do but this time at the Java runtime layer, we can uh, try to reduce that layer as much as we can. So you know that uh, in Java 9, we have introduced the modularity within the Java platform. And one of the things that the modularity provides is uh, JLink. So JLink is a tool that is part of the platform that gives you the ability to basically uh, create a custom runtime that will only have the modules that your application code needs. So, um, to show you what type of benefit we can get using JLinks, um, I've started from a full-blown GDK. So this is a GDK 13, so open GDK 13. Uh, well, almost, it weighs almost 320 megabytes. So, and that, so that's just the, GD, the GDK uh, with uh, the GRE. So that is quite a lot for running, for example, a very simple application. Now, when it comes to container, it's a very bad idea to carry bits that are not used. And typically, within a container, sorry, within a GDK, we have uh, utilities that will never be used when our container runs. Typically, uh, Java C, uh, JLink will not be used, uh, Java P, and so on and so on. So the first advice that we are giving you is don't use a GDK, but use a GRE, use a Java runtime. Uh, the thing is that in the past we had a separate distribution for the GDK and the GRE, the Java runtime, but we don't have these, uh, those di two distributions anymore. We have the GDK and that's it. But using JLink, you can create your own Java runtime, your own uh, Java runtime image. So uh, what I've done, and this is a very stupid idea, I've created a GRE that uses all the modules. It's a stupid idea because I'm not sure there is a way to write a sensible application that uses all the modules of the, Java, of the Java platform. I don't think that that application would make sense. But still, as an exercise, I did that. And if you do that, you will get a runtime image that weighs 168 megabytes. So you already see that by switching from the GDK to a uh, runtime image, not only it's a, it's, well, it's a good practice from a security uh, point of view, but it also reduced quite dramatically uh, the size of the Java runtime. So basically starting that code using that GRE instead of the GDK, at the container level, we can expect to have some improvements in terms of startup time. 
So creating a GRE with all the modules, that's a very stupid idea. What we want is to create a GRE that only contains uh, the modules of our code. That's what I did next. So for that, I'm using another tool, JDEPS, um, that will basically give me the list of um, modules used by my code. So in this particular example, I've used a serverless Java function, and for that serverless Java function, with all its dependency, uh, the, the runtime image only weight 15 megabytes. So you see that by switching from a full runtime to just the modules that we need, we save an un almost 130 megabytes. So that's again a huge win in terms of size, uh, but also uh, in terms of startup time f at the container levels. Next, uh, J-Links come with a set of uh, flags that you can use to still reduce uh, the size of the containers. For example, you can strip out the header files and the man page. I mean, when running your code into production, there is no need to have the man page embedded in the, in the application itself. Uh, you can also strip out uh, debugging information. There are two types of debugging information that you can remove from uh, the code. That's the native symbols. In the case of the Oracle OpenGDK build and uh, the Oracle GDK, they are, they are already out, so it's not useful to do that. It's already, done, it's already done for you. But you can also strip out the Java debug attributes. So if you do that, you remove the header file, the man page, and the Java debug attributes, you will save another six megabyte. We have two levels of compression, so JLink provides two levels of compression. So level one, basically from 44, you will go down to 37. And level two, you will go down to 34. So basically, all GDK to just a runtime that contains all the modules, you go from 316 to 178 megabytes. So that's already a huge win. Basically, you go from 100% to 56%, but we can do better. So we uh, only use the modules that our code needs. We remove stuff that are not needed at runtime, and we use uh, runtime. So basically, we can go down from 30, sorry, 316 to 34 megabytes. That's the kind of thing which is very important when you embed uh, Java in containers. So in this case, the Java runtime needed to run that Java function will only wait 34 megabytes. Now, there's something important to keep in mind here. We are basically reducing the size of the layers to uh, reduce the startup time of the containers. Uh, now, if we are using compression, compression means decompression at runtime. So uh, that's something you need to measure. Maybe it's not really useful to uh, use compression because basically you will not gain anything by doing that given that at runtime you will have to, well, your bits will have to be decompressed. Maybe you can just uh, stay at the 44 megabytes where you just remove the header files, the man page, and possibly the Java uh, debug attributes. That's something that you need to measure. But anyway, using JLink so to produce a custom runtime is important. So I'm gonna demo that so, you, so that you can see uh, how it works. For that, I'm gonna use FN, which is an open source fast pl platform. So it's a serverless platform that, that can run a uh, Java function, obviously. Technically, FN is written in Go, so it can also run a uh, Go function, but it can also run Python, uh, Node function, and so on. Why? Because FN is based on a container technology, so basically under the hood, FN is using containers. So uh, you as a developer don't have to worry about that. So let's have a quick look at FN. So there's nothing running in my container, so I'm gonna start FN in detach mode, and now I have FN running within my container. So that means that I can now use uh, uh, the FN tooling to basically create a uh, function. So let's see, uh, init image. Uh, now I need to remember which one is this, uh, GDK14 init, and let's call it uh, TPE14. So if I look at TP14, I have a simple Hello World Java function that is using a Java 14 um, that has been created uh, for me. The next thing that I want to uh, do is deploy my function. For that, I just need to create an application. An application is simply a way of grouping together uh, function, and then deploy. So the app is TP and the function is uh, TPE14. I'm gonna 
and I'm going to use verbose so that we can see what happened behind the scenes. And well, basically by using verbose, we see that uh, the FN tooling is simply using uh, Docker to basically turn my simple Java code into a Docker image that will be my serverless uh, function that I can now uh, invoke. So if I now look to FN list function within the TP application, I have one function that I should be able to invoke. So uh, FN invoke the application and the function is TP14. For the first time, it takes a bit of time, but given that it's, it's already hot, the container is already hot, the subsequent, subsequent time uh, are way faster. So that's why we basically want to make sure that our containers are as small as possible. The startup time is, is, uh, is important, especially within the uh, serverless space. Now, if you want to understand how it works, well, it's easy, because the FN tooling is creating a Docker file for us, not that one. And if you, well, if you zoom, you will see that here, basically, uh, JLink is being used, and here we are using everything. So, uh, so, so the FN tooling is using uh, is, is using JLink within the Docker container to create our Docker image of the function. And here it uses compression too. It removes the header file. It removes the man page. It strips out the Java debug information, and it produces this function uh, GRE runtime. And to it only add the modules using JDEPs that are being used by our uh, function.jar, which is compiled uh, above. So that's basically how it works. So the next thing that we can do is basically look at um, the function itself. So sorry, the, yeah, the function, and more specifically, the, the image of the function. So for that, I'm using dive. So this is basically what's inside my uh, container function that has been created by um, FN. So the first layer, 4.1, is the operating system. So that's Alpine. So that's a full-blown Linux operating system uh, that is needed to run our function. 2.4, that layer is basically the, the Java function layer. So we see that we have, for example, the function.jar. So that's the function itself that weight only three kilobytes. But then there are a bunch of dependencies that are needed by the function. As a developer, you don't really worry that's something that's handled by the tooling. And then we have this, this 34 megabyte uh, layer. That's the Java runtime layer. That, that includes everything and just that to run your code. In this case, to run the function. So there's no Java C, there's no JLinks, uh, there's no JDEPs, and so on and so on. It's a pure uh, runtime that will only be able to run uh, that Java function. And finally, we also have this 20 kilobyte layer that is something needed for uh, the FN platform itself. So, so that's basically what I've just shown. So using Jailing with Alpine, uh, that's very easy when using FN, but also uh, if you want to understand how it works, just look at the Docker file that FN produce. Uh, that's something that you can easily leverage with your own code. And one thing important to uh, use JLink, you don't need necessarily to have a modular, modularized application. So you can take any uh, uh, traditional Java application, uh, it will be able to run on a JLink uh, runtime image. Now, let's talk about uh, the startup time of the application itself. So, working at, so improving the layer size of the container will only get us that far. I mean, once the container is started, obviously we still have to uh, bootstrap all the Java stack that include the virtual machine and then the code. So this is a start of the startup time of a Java, simple Hello World Java application from eight to nine. You see that there is a huge gap. And uh, clearly in this case, uh, smaller is better. So that clearly means that we had a big regression uh, in Java 9 with the startup time. And I'm, I'm going to share you. I'm going to share a secret that we are using internally at Oracle to basically uh, boost the startup, to reduce the startup time of our Java application, and it's the following: we are just using the latest version of uh, Java. So you basically that see that now by uh, so Java 13 that we have released released two weeks ago, we have a startup time that is below the startup time of Java 8, which was already already very good at that time. Not only that, the startup time has been improved, but we have all the access to all the functionality which have been added to the platform since Java 8. So that's modularity, that's HTTP2 support, that's VAR, and so on, and so on. So we have fixed the regression that we have 
we had uh, NGDK 9, but we're keep, keeping working on uh, basically improving the startup time. And if you look uh, from 10 to 13, we had um, over 120 startup related uh, announcements that were brought uh, into the platform. So my advice, whenever you can, if startup time is important, uh, look at the latest version of the platform. If you're using containers, that's obviously very important, but if you're also using uh, Java outside of a containers, that's also a benefit that you will have access to. Something else that is very important, that is class data sharing. Anybody knows CDS, class data sharing? No? Um, the idea with CDS is very simple. So when you start a Java application, so Java-jar, basically a lot of things happen. So your jar uh, is unpacked, the all the classes are loaded into memory, um, but f to load a, a bytecode from a class into a memory representation, a lot of things need to be done by the GVM, uh, including security scanning and so on and so on. So the idea with CDS is that we will do that job, that work once, and then once we have an in-memory in representation of all your uh, class, the GVM will take a snapshot, dump it to disk, and the next time your application is started, the GVM will bring directly uh, the dump from disk to an in-memory representation so that we don't have to go through that work again and again. Because th that work is expensive, not only that, but obviously when you start a Java application, that works need to be done on all the classes. So that's the basic idea uh, with uh, CDS. And obviously, if we can avoid that work at startup time, that's something that will be uh, very beneficial to reduce the startup time of the Java code itself. So let's have a look at a quick demo. So for that, I'm gonna switch to uh, a Linux box running on a CI, so Oracle Cloud, if I have SSH, yes, no. So I'm running uh, on a, um, Ubuntu, Ubuntu VM in the cloud. I have no idea where I am. I think I'm in the US. Um, it's a bit slow because of the network. So I, ha I still have my uh, Hello World um, application that I'm gonna compile. Oh, by the way, you know that now since Java, I think 11, you can do uh, Java and di directly the class and it will be compiled and run, so you don't have to go through Java C. Nevertheless, I need the class in this case. So that's my application, so, oops, Java Hello World. So I'm gonna invoke that, invo that application uh, many times so that we can uh, see the benefit of CDS. So for that, I'm gonna use a little tool that is 42, so my application will be invoked uh, 42 times, and I'm gonna make sure that CDS uh, is not used because I'm on Java 13. Yes, Java 13 here. You see Java 13 and on 13 and I think 12 and possibly 11, it's on by default. So let's see. Cannot create Java virtual machine. Uh, Java, uh, what? On average, 198 milliseconds to uh, run that, uh, that code. Let's invoke it again, but this time, we're gonna use CDS, so to use CDS, I just uh, remove that flag, and given that it's on by default, we'll have CDS. So 199 without CDS, with CDS, 129 here. So that basically means that 119. So the startup time with CDS for that application is only a 65% of the startup time of the same application without CDS. So that's a huge win. And that's something that you have by default given that it's enabled in the platform. Now CDS is not something new. That's something that we have in the platform since Java 5, but it has evolved quite a lot since then. So in the early days, CDS was limited only to the class, to the runtime classes. So basically all the runtime.jar classes, the classes of the, the GDK itself. In Java 9, we have extended CDS to application classes. So basically your own classes, the classes of your own application. The thing is that in Java 9, it was a commercial feature uh, from the Oracle GDK. We have open source application CDS in 10, so it, it, in, since Java 10, that's something that you can use, and we're keeping uh, enhance, enhancing it. So for example, in Java 13, application CDS 
So before 13, for application CDS, so basically to create the dump of your own classes, you had to first do uh, a list of the classes that you want to be dumped from your application. Then you create the dump. And finally, uh, you use the dump, right? Since Java 13, it's easier. You just run the application one with this uh, minus xx archive class at exit, and that will produce the dump of your, uh, so the, your app CDS class dump when the, your application exits. And the next time you run the application, you just specify the path of that archive, and it will be directly loaded into memory by the GVM. So it's, way f it's more convenient to use it in Java 13. You can more easily create uh, the archive. Um, we saw using my very, my very basic example that uh, AppCDS and CDS uh, improve the startup time of uh, Java application, but don't take my words for it. This is a tweet that uh, Charles Nutter sent last week about uh, JRuby. So JRuby is a Ruby implementation running on top of the Java virtual machine. And basically with AppCDS in Java 13, that's the fastest startup time that they ever had uh, on JRuby. To give you some idea, uh, just look at the bottom one. So uh, they go, so the latest GDK 8, so update 202, they go from 843 milliseconds down to uh, 717 milliseconds with uh, Java 13. So that's something that is free and out of the box available for your own code. So that's, that's something that you should leverage, whether you are using uh, the GVM within a container, that's, obvious, that's obviously something which is uh, important in that context. But still, if you are using the GVM outside of the container, well, Starting faster is something that uh, we we'll always uh, look for. So that's something that you should uh, leverage. Something else that we can uh, look at to reduce the startup time is GraalVM. So uh, GraalVM is a high performance universal virtual machine. There is a typo, sorry for that. It's open source, so it's, uh, it's a project run by Oracle Labs and it provides many capabilities. I'm just gonna focus quickly on one capabilities and that's the native image capabilities. So the native image capabilities of Graal basically allows you to take a Java application, so uh, some Java byte code in the form of a jar, and you will give it to that native image tool and at the end of the day what you will get is a native uh, executable that will run on a given platform, typically on Linux. That native executable is all you need to run your Java application. So that means that you don't need to have any uh, external Java runtime installed. Obviously, given that we are starting from Java code, um, our Java code is, for example, expecting to have some memory management uh, provided by a runtime. What GraalVM does with native image is basically it embeds directly in the target uh, native executable, uh, the substrate VM, which is a lightweight VM. So basically what you will have at the end of the day is a single executable that will include everything, including the virtual machine, to, re to run your uh, Java code. So by doing that, you will, given that you will just have um, one single executable, uh, you will greatly reduce the startup time of that Java code. Not only that, that will also reduce the memory footprint. And something else uh, that, that is more a side effect uh, that native executable, uh, given that it doesn't need any external uh, Java runtime, will basically be smaller. So you can also expect to reduce the, start, the, sorry, the layer size of uh, the Java layer and the Java runtime layer. But that's more a side effect. And clearly, when we have the startup time uh, of Graal, uh, saving like 10 or 20 megabytes is not something that we are looking at because we are, we are very quick. Now, that doesn't come for free in the sense that Graal has today a few limitations. Like for example, today it's still, uh, Graal is still limited to Java 8. Having said that, the team is obviously actively working to support uh, Java 11 as quickly as they can. And there are other limitations. For example, if your code is relying heavily on reflection, then it might not be a good idea to rely on Graal. You will I likely have some difficulties to adopt Graal. But if you can work around those limitations, I really encourage you to uh, give it a try at Graal. Now, the last point that I want to quickly discuss, the GVM should behave as a, should behave as a good uh, container citizen. So this slide is busy, and I didn't even put all the, uh, the enhancements that we did from Java 8 to uh, 13 in there. 
but they are all related to basically the GVM running into container. And this is important, why? Because the GVM has what we call the ergonomics. The ergonomics is basically the ability that the Java virtual machine has to basically auto-tune itself based on the environment it runs on. So basically the, the GVM will look at some characteristic like how much memory do I have, uh, how much CPU do I have access to, and based on those metrics, it will try to provide a default behavior that will give you a decent and good performance. So, um, for that, to see why, uh, uh, well, wh wh what is the impact of ergonomics, let's go back to our uh, initial demo. So, let's quit, quit this box. So, let's see. So remember that we should have this container, so run, sorry, not that one. Well, let's build it again. So we have this TPE container, so docker run TPE. That's the hello world that we built at the beginning. Um, so you see that, for example, uh, it sees uh, three core. Uh, the GVM ergonomics will, based on those three cores, define that, decide that the command for join pool will use two cores. That's basically the ergonomics in action. Now, what we can do uh, using Docker, we can limit the resource that we allocate to our containers. So here I'm gonna, so three basically makes sense. I have four cores, so Docker is using three cores, and uh, the GVM, based, that, based on the fact that it, sweet, it, it sees three cores, will only use two cores for the command fork join pools. Here, I'm just uh, limiting my containers to one core. Let's see what happened. Uh, CPU, I think. No, it's not CPU. Let's see. Uh, minus minus CPU. No. So my container has only access to one core, and what we see here is that well, my Java virtual machine still see three cores, and hence my command for join pool is configured for two cores. So that clearly means that that code, that application, if it was running for more than one minute, will be killed by the containers. It will not behave correctly. Why is that? Well, that's simply because I'm using a very old Java version. That is not container aware. And how to solve that? Well, first my advice, never use java.latest because this is, uh, so that very old version is java.latest. Uh, so never use that image. And if you want to solve that, simply use J uh, OpenJDK and specify the latest version, or latest would be the same here. So let's run that, well, let's first build the container. So we have one CPU, let's see what happened. So you see, we have Java 13, so that's okay. We have one CPU, so our four joint pool is configured with one CPU. It makes sense. If we have two CPU, two CPU, it still has one CPU. I mean, with one CPU, it, can know, it, can, it cannot go below one CPU. And it has 500 megabytes of memory. And everything will be configured accordingly, including, including the GCs and so on. So if we limit the memory, for example, uh, I think it's minus M, uh, 64MB, I think. So we have two CPU and uh, 64 mem memory. So the container is quite limited. You see that basically the GVM automatically shows that it has uh, less memory. So here it has only allocated 30 uh, megabyte, which is very low. But anyway, we can expect that that application will keep running. Uh, it might be slow but it will never be killed by the container. Why? Because we are using a Java runtime that sees that it runs within a container. So, using uh, a recent version of the Java, Java virtual machine is key, uh, including uh, to support the ergonomics of the platform. So, uh, it's time to wrap up. We have a few minutes left. So, GVM in containers, Basically, uh, we have discussed how to reduce lat latency at two levels, at the container level, using, for example, jailing to reduce uh, the size uh, of the Java runtime layer, uh, using Alpine uh, to shrink the size of the operating system layer. That's one thing. 
And then we also discuss why it's important to use a recent version of the Java virtual machine, and namely that is making sure that the GVM sees and behave correctly when it runs within uh, that containers. So some uh, advice, you should always use a GRE when you are using Docker. So use a multi-stage build, for example, to build your container and only use a Java runtime instead of a full GDK. Use, whenever possible, the latest version of Java and never rely on java.latest. That would be a very bad idea. Nevertheless, what, whatever version you are using, always rely on an actively supported version. And, ad, and after that, it's just container as usual. So you need to choose your base image wisely. You might have seen these tweets that says that uh, the top most popular Docker containers each contain at least 30 security vulnerabilities. And, well, Java is not in there, but that doesn't mean that we're immu immune on the Java side. For example, a few months ago, uh, it has been discovered that some Debian distribution were using uh, an OpenJDK build that was tagged as a final release, and it was not a final release. So make sure that you are choosing your base image wisely, and then secure it. It's, well, at the end of the day, you are taking a base image on well, you are rel relying on someone else to, pro to, to do that uh, base image, making sure that it's a trusted entity, and next to that, make sure you are securing uh, your base image. That's important. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.